All right, great. Thank you, John. Um, can you guys see the correct display? Yes. All right. Um, so before I get started with my presentation, I wanted to put out a quick poll to see what kind of participation folks have had using Incident Command System. It looks like the, uh, oh, for a second they were slowing down. Um, so as you can see, I guess a lot of folks haven't participated using incident command system, although there are some folks out there who have. So luckily this is what I was expecting. Um, and my presentation is going to be very basic on incident command system and then kind of jump into how it's used with um, HWA in Lake George as an example. Let's see, there we go. All right, so again, my presentation structure is going to be about instant command structure, how it's set up, what the benefits are, um, when can it be used, and how it works in practice. So instant command system is really just a management tool to organize response efforts to various events. And it can be used for not only emergency events, but emergency events as well. I think some folks have used it for like planning a wedding or planning a really large get together. It's used for rallies, a whole variety of events. Um, so it's a standardized tool and it's got various standardized processes that guide how it's used and it represents best practices for management of events and response to events. It really helps coordination and communication for operation of the events as well as planning, logistics, and some of the finance needs. And it was orig originally created for wildfire response to help improve organization and efficiency. Um, it was created after there were failures in wild, wildfire response, even though those responses had enough resources and the correct tactics to wildfire in hopes that the organization, organization and efficiency would be improved. Again, I think coordinating with planning logistics and finance needs. So an in incident command system, when it's set up, each person has their own defined job and the job role is standardized. The roles don't have to relate to a person's regular job title, although sometimes they do. And everyone does tasks within their roles and tries not to move outside of their roles to avoid that duplication that some projects have. Um, really quickly going through the roles, the main ones are the incident commander, the operations, planning, and logistics, and finance section chiefs. And the incident commander uh, guides the objectives to the operation, decides where the operation is moving. Um, safety officer lets every no everyone know what the safety hazards are and how to try to avoid those hazards. Public information officer is in charge of putting out the message for the response and communicating with the media. The liaison talks about or communicates with the stakeholders and keeps them up to date, as well as lets the incident commander know what the stakeholders' needs are. The operations section chief is in charge of all the operations, mostly the boots on the ground. Uh, planning section creates all of the meetings and helps keep everyone on task and help everyone coordinate. Um, they also manage some of the resources, so they kind of bring the people and equipment into the response, working with the logistics section chief, and help track how those resources are being used while keeping track of all of the GIS information. So, you know, mapping stuff. Um, the logistics section uh, really orders a lot of the equipment and moves it around from place to place. While the finance and administration section 
uh, let the response know if there are funds to do the objectives that we want to get done. Um, so in an incident command setup, each person only reports to one supervisor. It might not actually be their uh, supervisor in like real life, I guess you might say, within their organization. But this helps divide up the responsibilities of the overall response. Um, so the person who's in charge, like the incident commander, is not directly running all aspects of the project, typically. Um, the benefits of ICS is that there's a defined structure and defined roles, which really helps people know who's doing what and leads to accountability and a lower amount of duplication of the different efforts that have to go on inside a typical response. There's also standardized terminology. So everyone knows what everyone else is talking about. Um, there's a defined planning process that really helps guide the planning of the response and helps relate the objectives to the actual operations as they happen on the ground to make sure what's going on on the ground will actually lead to what the goal of the response is. And overall, it helps incorporate resource management and integrate communications between all of the different people who are working inside a response, as well as with stakeholders and with the public. And focusing some more on communication, there's benefits like having frequent contact with stakeholders um, and having a single point of contact for the media and a single message going out to the media, as well as um, extra support for planning logistics and finance and including those inside the operational decisions for the response. So instant command system can be implemented for nearly any scenario. It's, it's made to be pretty flexible. So you can have one person who's the incident commander and doing all of the other roles, but just walking through the planning structure, or you can fill out roles as they're needed, depending on how complex the situation is. Um, for invasive species, at least this is all my opinion, I think it's especially useful for rapid response projects where there's like a really quick turnaround like for HWA, we found it in July and treatment needed to be needed to be complete by the end of October. Um, species specific eradication control projects, projects that involve multiple people and or organizations, especially if they're shared resources, um, really complex projects and projects that might be really high interest to stakeholders and or the public. And if folks are interested in setting up an ICS, I think before setting up the ICS, it's really important to have some training and some practice in ICS. So there are some workshops that are around and offered occasionally to some people. And actually, I think what really helps is communicating and working with people who have done ICS before to help kind of walk through all the processes and help avoid any pit, pitfalls that might actually exist in running the ICS itself. Um, in addition, I think it's really useful, and this might not just be for ICS, but just overall reviewing the resources that folks have and developing plan to, plans to share resources with partners and stakeholders. This might be through mutual aid agreements it might just be through other agreements that you have with partners, um, as well as tracking those resources, tracking the equipment and how it can be used and tracking who is available to help with various responses to invasive species, what their qualifications are, if they have experience inside ICS or experience just treating certain invasive species. Knowing that ahead of a rapid response, I think is really useful to getting people out and on the ground really quickly. So talking more about when to start an ICS, it can be set up as soon as an invasive species threat has been determined. So like for spotted lanternfly, we worked with the, the Department of Agriculture and Markets a couple of years ago to get an ICS started. 
just to prepare and make sure everyone was ready. Um, and this is the standardized planning process that's followed through ICS. Um, there's two sections to it, really, initial response and like kind of a continued section. But I've summarized them in the next slide, as I don't want to get like too much into the nitty gritty. Um, but this bottom of the planning key, it's just kind of the stem there. It's the beginning of the incident. So it's what happens as soon as you start the ICS, or as, as soon as you identify the invasive species threat. And this part is where you determine who's in charge, and you start to assess the situation and notify the stakeholders and start to determine what the initial objectives are going to be. And then the next part, of course, is the top of that planning P. And that's what happens for the rest of the incident. If you can see inside the planning P, there's um, arrows that point around. So this is a continuous process. It keeps happening over and over for the rest of the incident. And for this process, you're determining strategies and tactics, recording and updating the plans for the site. You're assigning and mobilizing resources to go and do the work, informing stakeholders on what has happened, assessing how successful the objectives have been, the tactics, the strategies, and just kind of reevaluating everything over and over again. And with that, I wanted to kind of talk about ICS in practice, especially for that initial part of starting an ICS. And the example I'm going to use is HWA on Lake George. Um, so going through that planning P, I've laid it out in various steps of what you go through as you're starting an ICS and running it later on. Um, so step one is really setting up the incident command structure and notifying both the agencies that are going to be involved and the stakeholders. So Hemlock Lily Adelgid was reported to IMAP Invasives late July, and then there took, it took a little bit of time to contact the camper who actually reported HWA, but within two weeks, we had uh, one of our staff people actually go out to the site and confirm that Hemlock Willie Adelgid was on the site. At this point, um, it was decided that DEC, who already had a Hemlock Willie Adelgid program in place, was going to lead the incident command. And Brian, who was the incident commander, set up the initial command structure, which was that slide a couple times ago, just the hierarchy and whose roles were who. After this, um, potential stakeholders were notified um, we worked really close with APIP and the DEC Region 5 staff to identify the stakeholders in the region and sent out a press release on 811 and then had actually a stakeholder meeting on 818 to go over more in depth what we were planning to do and what had been done to that point so far. After that, you assess the initial situation so you choose your goal, which a lot of invasive species responses might be eradication or control. In this case, we didn't know if it was going to be eradication or control. So we needed more surveys to really decide what the goal was. So our initial goal ended up being um, control or eradication if possible until we got more information. After that, you look for approvals the land over, from the landowner as well as if there's permits needed for treatment. Um, the landowner approvals in this case ended up, it ended up being on DEC land at first. So we didn't need any approvals for the landowner, which was really useful in getting people out right away. Um, then we started looking for resources and we actually canvassed the stakeholders to see what resources they had as well to get as many people out as soon as we could. In this case, it was surveyors, and boats and pesticide applicators. Um, the site that was initially found was really only accessible by boat. There were some trails in, but it would take like several hours to hike in. So having people with boats was really useful for this particular response. And we started to evaluate some of the potential safety hazards and started making like 
a safety plan. And the next step is just recording that initial information. So putting it down on paper, really, uh, the situation history, the goals, objectives, priorities at that point in time, summary of the actions that have been done at that point, a map of the initial location of HWA in this case, the initial ICS structure, any issues that have been encountered or that we expected to encounter just so we would keep them in mind and start to address them if we could, and a list of resources that were available at the time as well as resources that were still needed. So the next step moves into that top portion of the planning piece. So this step and the next steps will be repeated over and over. Um, so at this point, we set the objectives, which were to determine the extent of hemlock lily adelgid in the Lake George area, uh, delimit or um, I guess better outline the extent of the known sites and help uh, control the spread of HWA. So to determine strategies, um, the planning process has you set a timeline, which is called an operational period. And it's just the period that you um, have folks out on the ground actually doing survey treatment or whatever strategy you're impl implementing. Um, we knew that we had a really short turnaround for HWA treatment. So we set a short operational period of one week usually for emergency responses, um, like fires. Um, the operational period is within 24 hours, like it's a much shorter period. For invasive species though, um, at least what I've been involved in, we have much longer operational periods. So this one was a week and we wanted to make sure everything we could accomplish would be accomplishable in a week. Um, so. During week one, we wanted to do a boat survey around the Tongue Mountain Peninsula, um, delimit three of the six known infestations, distribute outreach materials to nearby trailheads, and create social media posts related to um, reporting sightings. So trying to get people, the public, to actually look for HWA in their areas. The next step is actually assigning resources. So you look at what resources you have and what resources you still need. With those that you have, um, you can assign them to specific tasks. And for each task, you should have an equipment list. So of course, know what you're going to bring out into the field and having a list of people and their experience, which will help know how much training those folks need. Um, at this point, we started to define the protocols or collect them from various locations. I think we worked with uh, the New York State Hemlock Initiative um, to collect their boat survey protocol and brought in the protocol for DEC and New York State Hemlock Initiative for survey. And we selected what data collection method we were going to have folks use. So all the data came into one place, which is really useful and really important. Um, after this, we created an incident action plan, which is again, part of that typical standardized planning structure. And this plan covered that week long operational period. And the incident action plan has the objectives, strategies, the crew and resources assignments for the week, um, the safety information, crew contact information, and the ICS structure. And as part of this next step, which was briefing crews and the ICS staff, the incident action plan was sent out to everyone. And in the field, crews are typically briefed on what their assignments are to make sure that they know what they're doing and how their assignment fits into the overall operation of what's going on. So after that week long period, or step eight, I guess, includes that week long period, which is having people actually on the ground and carrying out those strategies and tactics, um, which is done by the operation section. Um, the data is collected, crews gain experience, protocols are adjusted, and data is evaluated to determine if it was successful and if it could be made more efficient. Um, so this part is 
both putting people on the ground and doing things as well as assessing how it's going, which usually for an initial response, it takes maybe an operational period or so before um, things start getting more and more efficient, which I think is typical for all responses. Um, so continued response, um, after that week long period is ended, usually you make a situation report, which just has all of the data of, on what has occurred. So the number of acres surveyed, a map of where the boat surveys have occurred, and some of the information from that situation report is sent out to stakeholders typically at this point, just to let them know what has happened and what is going on. And after this, typically you repeat steps four through nine that I just listed in PowerPoint um, for the next week. So you're going to be reevaluating those objectives. Is this still an eradicatable um, infestation of HWA or do we need to switch to a control methodology? And with that, you also reevaluate the strategies and tactics. Like was boat survey working? Were the surveyors um, getting to the site in an efficient manner? That sort of thing. Um, and with all of that being reevaluated, you record that data and you update the plans and you create a new IAP, which will, that again, mobilize more resources and can be used to further update success. And that's really just the breakdown that I prepared for today. So I don't know if you guys have any questions. It looks like um, Meredith already put into the chat box the training uh, for ICS 100, oops, sorry. But there's also a free online training for ICS 200. Um, those aren't invasive species specific, so they might be weird to sit in on and think about for invasive species, but it's worth, I guess, wrapping your head around ICS structure. That's really it. So are there any questions though?